Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be venturing into Skimwalker territory, so I hope you're ready. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to author Jordan Tyler Quinn Farkas, who kindly allowed us to narrate his Skimwalker experience. He has encountered his fair share of creepy things during his lifetime, and has published it in a book which can be found in the top of the description if you are interested. His story is number two. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I'd like to share some background information about myself. I was raised by my mother, who is 50% Cherokee and 50% French. Us kids have never met our biological grandpa, and believes in paranormal things, but tries to pretend they aren't there. My father is Scottish, English, German, and Jewish by blood. He, on the other hand, is 100% atheist, and is rather skeptical about things he can't explain, and endeavours to be a logical and scientific person in all things. Due to major differences in personalities, beliefs, and values, they divorced when I was eight. She soon married my stepfather, who was a devout Southern Baptist from Mississippi, and basically gave up her identity as a native, and became a God-fearing woman. Despite issues with my mother, my dad continued to let us visit with her mum and stepdad, because he felt they were good people. They taught us many things about native culture, spirituality, legends, and the people. My grandmother and I spent a lot of time together, so I was given an opportunity to learn Cherokee medicine. My grandma comes from a long line of medicine women and men, and is one herself. Now, so many years later, at the ripe old age of 23, I am myself one of them. You now have some insight. About two years ago, my father, brother and I moved into a new home, a little more in the country than our previous homes had been something we all thoroughly enjoyed because we grew up immersed in nature and loved the land. Shortly after moving there about three months in, I decided it was time to expand my family by getting myself a puppy. This would be the first dog that would actually be in my care. I've always had a strong connection to dogs, as my guiding spirit is a wolf. And after a while of searching, I came across a beautiful five-month-old male German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I went to meet him and instantly fell in love. He was the greatest, very sweet, kind to the cats and protective of me, and became my best friend. Everything you could want in a dog. Now anyone who has owned a puppy or young dog knows that potty training is a task, even after being with us two months, he still would wake me up every two to four hours to go outside. Hard on the circadian rhythm, but it had to be done. On this occasion, in particular, we got a late night visitor we weren't expecting. My dog woke me up in the night, this time around 2.45, and I wasn't ready but dragged myself out of bed, clicked on the leash, opened the back door, and greeted me with a cool breeze. I rolled my eyes and went out into the yard with my pooch. He did his usual dog thing, sniffed around, jumped in the freshly cut grass, completely forgetting what we'd come outside to do in the first place. I whistled at him, recaptured his attention, and he got back to his business. He squatted, and I turned my head to the sky, offering some privacy. The moon was exceptionally large that night, almost full but not quite. During this observation, I began to realise... There was no typical nighttime noise around me. As if this wasn't unusual enough, I had a shiver go down my spine and my arm hairs began to stand on end. That's when I heard my dog let out a low growl as he pinned himself against my legs. When I looked down at his tail, it was tucked and hackles were raised. When I tried to move, he pressed himself against me more. Another shiver came over me and now I took the opportunity to follow where his eyes were looking. They were looking to what appeared to be a coyote. Not totally uncommon in the area, we'd heard of them on many nights living here. But this was different. It looked different and felt different. The most frightening thing, however, 
was that it was looking right back at me. I didn't move. I didn't take my eyes off it. That's how I was able to see its features so clearly in the moonlight. Its fur looked thin, even bald in some spots. Its eyes were yellow, not reflective yellow like you see on a dog in the dark, but yellow like the sun, very powerful and almost blinding. Then looking more closely, I noticed its back legs were longer than a normal coyote, longer than any canine creature should be actually starting at the hips, and going down, they seem to look almost bipedal in design. That's when it dawned on me just what I was seeing. I picked up my 60 pound dog, never taking my eyes off the creature. As I did, I said a Shiroki prayer in my head that I had learned from my grandma. As if it were physically upset, it backed up slightly. And then I heard a voice that perfectly mimicked my grandma say, Why would you do that, Mickers? No one aside from my grandparents ever called me that. It was their special name for me. With that, I darted for the door, dog still in my arms. I put him down and locked the door behind me. The noise must have awoken my brother, because when he came into the kitchen all bothered, he asked me, what was going on and why the dog was all riled up. I held my finger to my mouth and shut off the light. We then made our way into the living room, shut that light off as well. And like something out of a horror movie, the outline of a tall humanoid thing shone through the stained glass window on the door. Thanks to the bright moonlight. We both froze and he made a grab for the knob when it started to turn, capturing it just in time to lock it. That's when it spoke to him, but this time in my grandpa's voice. Baba, why don't you let grandpa in? They live on the reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. His face turned ghostly white, and he turned to me. That's when I mouthed the word, and he paled even more. It began to tap on the glass and we both went into my room and ignored the knocking. The next night around the same time, the tapping grew louder. We sat in the living room, praying to Ulenanuhi, the Cherokee sun goddess, also called the Great Spirit, that it would go away. The tapping turned into knocks which turned into pounding the more we prayed. This must have awoken my father because he came downstairs in a half. We told him about the night prior during the day and he didn't believe us and thought it was just one of my brother's friends being an ass. So when he saw the silhouette in the window, he grew even more angry, made a beeline for the door and we yelled at him not to open it. However, instead of harming him, it seemed to be afraid because it got down on four legs and disappeared down the road. My dad's face paled as he stumbled back a few steps. He locked the door behind him and we all went to bed. The next day, we spoke of the situation. I explained to him the natives call this creature a skinwalker. They aren't very common in Cherokee land. They're more of a Western native legend, but my grandparents still taught us about them. Dad being a skeptic, just summed it up to a weird thing he could explain later. Later that day, I went to our local craft store and bought juniper ash as my grandma instructed and sprinkled it around our house. It never returned, but my dog was never the same after that night. It's as though the entire experience changed him. He went from a loving animal to mean and unpredictable. He started lashing out to anyone who wasn't female. We tried correcting it over the course of a year and a half, but nothing helped. He finally harmed my brother, causing him to bleed and I was forced to find him a new home. Luckily, he is with a couple who are both female and he seems much happier. But even to this day, I guarantee he won't go out at night. I didn't mention the name of the creature many times because it's considered a bad omen in native culture to give these things energy. If anyone is nervous, let me know and I will happily walk you through a prayer ritual my grandma taught me. I hope you enjoyed and pleasant dreams. 
In the late spring of 2014, I made the long and scenic trek from Kansas to Arizona. It was in early May, after packing up an apartment full of way more than enough stuff for two people, we removed ourselves from the flatlands and wheat fields of eastern Kansas to the high desert of Arizona. After everything was packed into the box truck, and the car was secured onto the pull behind car dolly, I started the 1500 plus mile trip for the first time. I had never been further west than Colorado prior to that particular trip, as I was born and raised between the Midwest and the eastern side of the United States. Little did I know, I would make the drive again a year later, to collect the belongings we left behind at the cabin when we'd abandon it. I'll never forget driving through Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. There is just something about that part of the country, that specific region, that just is flat out magical to me. And apparently I'm not the only one who feels this way. If you've never been, I suggest you do if you ever get the chance. The first evening that I arrived in Arizona, the sun had already gone down as I made my way off the main highway about 40 miles from the Grand Canyon, and picked my way through the well-worn dirt roads that led out across the desert and towards the cabin that I would be renting for the next several months. I didn't know much about the cabin before my arrival, other than it was supposed to be entirely self-sufficient, with a 500 gallon water tank and four full-sized solar panels, including areas for gardening, walking trails, RV pads, and that the nearest town was located several miles away. In addition, the world's largest stretch of Ponderosa Pine Forest, 1.8 million acres, was situated just 10 miles from the cabin, in the Coconino National Forest. This particular national forest was something I had been very much looking forward to get into explore. It was in this area of the expanse of Ponderosa Pine Forest that I first saw a wild wapiti, Native American for elk. In actuality, there were three of them, each one massive, and was standing shoulder to shoulder, as if posing for a photo. Likewise, each one had an enormous rack. They were easily four feet tall with more points that I could count. I had never seen a wild elk before, let alone three large and picturesque bulls like this. I wish I had been able to take a picture of that magnificent view. I saw several more while I was in the area over the course of the next few months. However, I never did see any more that was so large or with such tall racks as those three bull wapitis from the first night. Being somewhat of a mystic, I instantly took it as an extremely excellent sign to see such impressive stags so close to the cabin, as if they were waiting to greet me, just standing outside of the tree line on the edge of the road, in some strange way, I honestly felt like they wanted to say hello. The cabin itself was everything that I expected and needed at the time. It had a built-in garage, a full loft bedroom, living room, working bathroom with solar shower and flush toilet, a kitchen sink, stove, and a lovely workshop located in the garage. In other words, once I gathered up some necessary supplies from the nearest town, I wouldn't need to interact with anyone on a day-to-day -day basis for long periods of time. And honestly, that was the plan to begin with. The first week or so was spent exploring the general area, including several trips to Williams and Flagstaff, Williams being the nearest town, as well as hiking around through various areas of the Arizona high desert. There were little in the way of trees, other than the above mentioned Ponderosa Pine Forest, as well as scatterings of junipers, which where I come from, seem more like large bushes than actual trees. I hiked in the Coconino National Forest a few times, and I enjoyed it very much. However, I didn't get to spend as much time there as I had hoped to. That said, the area directly around the cabin, 
all 15 acres of the property as well as the hundreds of surrounding acres, were far more interesting than I had anticipated. Once I became familiar with the acreage, I went to work for three solid days building a sanctuary in the middle of the property. During my day hikes around the cabin, I found a perfect outcropping of juniper trees which appeared to be an old solid clump. But upon further exploration I discovered one could be entered into this particular grove of trees. Inside there was a much more considerable amount of hidden space than it appeared from the outside. To me it was perfect. This hidden corpse of junipers was the space that I decided to build my stone altar on. Furthermore, I paved a path of sand and stone from the entrance of the hidden grove up to the altar, and eventually beyond. I inlaid the central space with a full moon and crescent moons, using the red rocks found easily in the nearby desert. Beyond this sacred spot, Reserved for the altar, I extended the stone pathway to a full circle that I created for meditation and metaphysical workings. I raked and smoothed the working circle, the centre of the circle rather, cleaning it of all debris and broken stone until it was the same consistency of a charred sandbox. Next, I gathered four gigantic stones from the surrounding desert. One stone from all four of the cardinal directions, and I place the large bulky stones according as capstones to my working circle. Once the circle was complete, I extended the red rock inlay of my sanctuary floor, from where it ended slightly beyond the altar, all the way to the working circle in between the circle with the altar and the working circle. I inlaid another full moon with two crescent moons, the sign of the triple goddess into the walkway. Each morning when I would meditate, facing the east, sitting in the middle of my circle, as the sun rose over the desert, when I could feel the warmth of the sun begin to warm my inner eye, only then was my morning meditation ritual complete. I repeated these meditations throughout the day, by meditating in the correlating directions of the sun at noon, and again directly before sunset as well. In all honesty, I would have to say that I've never been so in tune with myself. That said, I constantly had the feeling of eyes upon me. I cannot tell you how many times I stopped hiking and spun around expecting to see some person, predator, or something darting behind a juniper or cactus. I never did catch a glimpse of whatever it was, but I do have a feeling that I know why. It is a strange thing to try and convey to something else. I suppose those feelings are similar to those of a hunter who spent years hunting and tracking prey. After a while, they are able to develop a sixth sense, and able to feel when something is watching them. That's how I felt. I have heard Native Americans describe the same feeling before. I know it's cliche, that you have the feeling that someone's watching you. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about, but just much stronger, and it never went away. Some Native Americans proclaim it to be a thin veil between the worlds, and that the ancients inhabiting the other side can see through it, but that most people are very much unaware of its existence. I'm sure that many of the strange occurrences that I experienced during my time at the cabin had a lot to do with this bizarre feeling of being watched continuously without break. Spending three days of building my sacred space was an experience that I will always remember and cherish. Actively using the area is another experience that I will never forget. That said, many strange things happened there. One day I was hiking through the adjacent desert hills surrounding the cabin. I ventured further away from the property by at least a couple of miles further than usual, and I came across a massive skull of what I could only assume was a longhorn deer. However, it immediately reminded me of the great white buffalo that is sacred to so many Native American nations. The skull was enormous and had two large horns coming out of it, 
as well as being completely covered in thick snow and white fur. I carried the skull home and properly, after consecrating and blessing it, placed it on my stone altar, where it became the centerpiece until I left for good. I don't know what became of that sacred space, but it sure meant a lot to me. I was heading north and east of the cabin and was staying in just outside of Flagstaff and Williams, almost precisely the moment that I turned onto a particular highway a stream of shadowy winged figures began swooping back and forth over the top of my car. Please try to imagine a long and lonely stretch of road through the heart of the four corner regions where there is little water, hardly any trees at all, and is otherwise very uninhabitable. There are no other cars on the road for miles and miles. I don't recall passing even a single car on that particular stretch of road that night also, though I had to traverse it for several hours. As soon as I turned onto this particular road, a large shadowy figure started swooping around back and forth over my car. At first I thought it was a bat of some kind or a nocturnal bird, but I wasn't aware as much. I was still new to the southwestern region of the United States at the time. I really didn't think much about it, and just kept driving. However, about five minutes into the occurrence, it seemed as if more and more of these things started streaming into the air above my car. Whatever they were, they were keeping up with the speed of my vehicle. So I accelerated. I was taking the car over 100 miles per hour, and to my complete horror, the dark winged figures were still keeping up with my vehicle, like it was no problem at all. Perhaps 10 minutes into this bizarre situation, I was flying down the road at a speed of nearly 120, and eventually decided to slow the car down to the creeping speed of 15 miles per hour. I was barely moving at this point, but nothing changed. Not knowing what exactly to think or expect, I merely resumed the speed limit, maybe five to 10 miles above it for the remainder of this road. And the winged things continued to follow me. I would assume that this experience occurred through only at least 30 miles. However, it could probably be a bit more. After that terrifying experience, I finally came across an eatery made a pit stop to take a bite, and noticed that over the road, there was a Navajo museum. This caught my attention. I finished my food excitedly and got out to explore the Navajo collection. The entire thing was dedicated to the Navajo people, as those lands even now belong to their nation. The whole area was a Navajo reservation and even the encounter I described earlier with the winged shadows flying over the top of my car for miles occurred on Navajo land. The museum wouldn't amount to much for the average person, I'm sure. I highly doubt that it received much attention. I myself spent the better half of an hour going through the handful of exhibits and reading each plaque with detail. Each display was filled with basic things, tools, mock dwellings, and other artifacts. All in all, the place explained a great deal about the Navajo people and how they'd managed to survive in such a harsh landscape. After I finished walking through the place and checked it all out, I ran across a hitchhiker. It was not only the first hitchhiker I'd seen on the trip, it was in fact the first person or vehicle I'd seen in hours aside from the pit stop. I started slowing down as soon as I passed him and noticed how heavy his gear was and also took note of how he appeared to be Native American. Pulling over to the side of the road, my car came to a stop 50 yards or so ahead of the man. I watched him through my rear view mirror as he hunkered down and began running when he'd realized that I was stopping for him. I asked if he needed a ride, to which he replied in the affirmative, and told me he was going in the same direction I was, and that he just needed a lift for the first 
30 miles or so. I jumped out, threw his stuff in the trunk, and then jumped back into the driver's seat and took off with my new passenger. Over the next half hour, we shared some lovely conversations. I found out he was full-blooded Navajo and went by the Christian name Raymond. He was well known in the area, or so he claimed, and that he had lived there for his entire life. When we approached Flagstaff, he asked to be dropped off near an underpass as I was heading further south and he needed to go west towards Arizona slash California. I pulled off the major highway that Raymond and I had been traveling on for several miles and let him out underneath the off ramp. He indicated for me to pull over at. Thumbling down cars near underpasses and overpasses where two interstates connect is quite reasonable for hitchhikers as they have an easier time catching a ride along these stretches of highway and interstates than anywhere else. I offered him a brand new tent and some other gear that I just happened to have in the back of my car as an avid hiker, and I had purchased some extra equipment. You see, Raymond had explained to me how his previous gear had recently been ruined due to certain circumstances. So after a tiny bit of coaxing, he graciously accepted. What happened next was one of the strangest things. By the time I left Raymond with his gear and doubled back around onto the highway, Heading south, I had a clear view of where I had just left him, and he was nowhere to be seen. There is no way possible that in this short amount of time, Raymond and all the gear that just left the vehicle had vanished. He couldn't have walked off very far in any direction, and it was fairly visible everywhere. I feel that it's important to take a moment to mention that during our conversation, because of my genuine liking for this man, as well as recognizing the hardship he was currently facing in life, I offered him an open invitation to come and stay on the property that I was wanting any time that he made his way out. There was a second cabin, albeit much smaller, which had previously been occupied by a Navajo. He'd been a friend of the woman who owned the land, and quite frankly, he was also a man that I rather enjoyed having a conversation with the few times that I had the pleasure. However, I find it critical to mention this open invitation was for a reason, and the reason is that I gave Raymond the exact location of the cabin, as well as directions as to how to get there from the nearest town, Williams, Arizona. Having grown up in the region, and being 50-something years old, I'm sure it wouldn't take him long to find his way there. That same night, extraordinarily upsetting things began to take place in the cabin, for the first time since being there, which at this point had been several weeks, I heard coyotes for the first time. Previously, I had heard them far off in the distance, but never near the actual property. I hadn't found their tracks around the place either. I thought it was a bit strange that they didn't seem to be cutting through the property, as it was several acres wide, being 15 acres, and I could clearly hear them near the surrounding properties, which were much more extensive. There were plenty of rabbits and small game near the cabin. I kicked them up daily when I walked around the place. However, at the time, I had much bigger issues to worry about than why coyotes weren't bothering me. The night after I returned from my trip, I slept well. Lots of things on my mind. And the next morning, of course, I noticed the coyote tracks around the cabin. I didn't think very much of it as I had obviously heard them and knew that they had been there. However, the next morning was a different story altogether. That night, the coyotes returned to run circles around the house for what seemed to be half the night. Almost no sooner had my head hit the pillow did I hear the footsteps of what sounded like a rather large pack running around it. Not long after, I began to hear their heavy footfalls pounding through hard-packed earth around the cabin. They continued yipping and yapping for some time. That's right around the time, I was once again reaching the rationalization that maybe they had driven another poor old little rabbit into the area, despite the fact I didn't find any fur nor blood, or indicators that they had actually found one or eaten it. This is when I hear a clear and distinct sound, claws on the door. The way that this particular cabin is set up, or was at the time at least, the entire upstairs floor stretched the length of the cabin, 
and was set up as the only bedroom in the place. I had set up my bed in a particular area, which was located on top of the garage, and the headboard was directly above the wooden side door of the cabin which led into the garage. This was also the main entrance to the cabin, as the other two entrances were an automatic garage door which made no sense to open on a daily basis to get in or out of the cabin, and a set of double glass sliding doors on the side of the living room, which also wouldn't make much sense to be opening and closing numerous times a day. So the little wooden door on the side of our cabin was our maintenance entrance. And that is the door that I heard the claws scratching. You can only describe terror and shock in so many ways, with so many words, none of which accurately do it justice whatsoever. What I felt lying in my bed and hearing something run around the cabin, scratching on the doors as if trying to get in. I could not convey to you in words if I use 10,000 to do so. Paralyzing fear, that must be the closest. That said, it doesn't bother me to admit the terror that gripped my entire being as I heard something steadily scratch on the door. I began to wonder how it could actually withstand something trying to break through. It wasn't a very expensive door. It didn't consist of solid oak or anything like that. In fact, I believe it was probably made more like particle board with a thin layer of real wood on either side. So I knew it wouldn't take long for the door to give way and allow whatever was outside to get in. I often wonder why I didn't get up, go down and open the door to see what was out there. And then I quickly remember the unnatural terror I felt at the time, and remembered that what I did do was lay there paralyzed with fear until I fell asleep, only to wake up and realize it was already next morning, with the sunshine shining through. My morning ritual at the time consisted mainly of meditating in my outdoor sanctuary, and the returning to the cabin shortly after sunrise to prepare coffee, and then relax outside near a large, raised bedstone circle garden, where I would then feed the three ravens, Edgar, Alan, and Poe, the latter of which would behave somewhat like pets returning daily, day after day for the table of scraps we left them, like offerings inside the stone circle. Sipping coffee, chills ran through my body as I suddenly recalled what happened the night before, and what had occurred the previous night as well. When I couldn't take it anymore, I went from my chair to look around the cabin, only to find what appeared to be the tracks of an entire pack of coyotes. Tracks upon tracks. But amongst these, several more massive tracks could be seen. They were obviously disturbed by the smaller ones, which greatly outnumbered the larger ones. This little fact left with me even more questions as I knew full well that no wild dog or wolf is going to accept it and run into a pack of wild coyotes. Keep in mind that it is nothing for a pack of coyotes in this particular region of the country to number well in the dozens. The tracks, the massive ones, piqued my curiosity and left me scared, because it was only then that I remembered the scratching sound. I ran to the door, remembering the eerie noise and stepped in front of the simple wooden door. I felt my heart beat against my chest. There were several sets of long and deep scratch marks that stretched from about the middle of the door and ran several feet up the door almost to a stop. I really had to fight with myself to remain calm and not freak out. You see, as a long time independent researcher of folklore and mythology, an indigenous culture from all over the world, including the oral law of Native Americans. I had the sinking suspicion of what may be responsible for the marks, but couldn't bear myself to admit it at the time. Perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects about these incidences that took place over the course of the few days was not just the tracks, let alone the deep gorging scratches on the door, but the fact that for me, to clearly see so many tracks around the cabin, I could not for the life of me find the source of where they came from. It's as if they only appeared out of thin air outside the cabin, ran circles and then vanished again from whence they came. To claim that I understood what happened on the property would be a bald-faced lie, 
To say that I've come to my own conclusions, these several years later based on countless hours of research, before and after the events described, I would very much believe that I was in the presence of a real life skinwalker. Native American legends say that these creatures are actually thought to be humans twisted by greed and dark magic, and are not creatures at all, and have been known by local Native Americans to frequent the area for centuries. In fact, the skinwalkers are better known amongst members of the Navajo Nation more than any other in the country. Many people don't believe that they exist anywhere else in the world outside of this particular region, as they are thought to be Native Americans who's lost their way and given into dark powers. What I will say, however, is that I still deeply believe deep down that Raymond and possibly some of his friends had paid me a visit and would yet pay me another. On the third night after I'd picked up Raymond, the yipping and yapping coyotes, as well as the pitter patter of their claws circling the cabin, found its way to my ears once more. At that point, I was beyond trying to understand what was happening, and even further beyond trying to confirm it. I had no way of proving anything, and no intention of trying to do so. I have convinced myself, in my heart, that what I experienced out there for three nights in a row was none other than a Navajo skinwalker, maybe possibly more, in its own territory. As far as what you decide to believe, that's entirely up to you. After the events of those nights, it wouldn't be for a few more short weeks before I lost my nerve and left the cabin for good due to other circumstances, somewhat similar, but yet worlds apart. For my own safety, I left Arizona and never returned, save one time during many months later with several other people to gather up my belongings. To this day, I wouldn't step one foot back onto that particular piece of property, especially at night even if you paid me. One time, me and two other friends from Miami went home to my home in Kansas to visit my grandmother because she wasn't doing well. She passed later that month. And one night, me and my friend went out on a drive while my other friend stayed with my grandma to check on her every once in a while. Me and my friend had went to go out I don't remember to get what exactly, probably milk. We'd taken a wrong turn. At this part, it almost seemed like out of a movie. Our radio stopped working. It was about 10 PM, and we were in the middle of a random dirt road in nowhere, Kansas. Me and my friend get out the car to see our surroundings because there wasn't service. And after about five minutes of being outside the car, we see a very large deer jumping around in the field to our right side. I get my buddy to look at the deer and he sees it. It was maybe 50 yards away from us, about half a football field. The deer seen us too. It all goes silent. The deer starts to let out this loud scream that almost sounds like an elk, but a lot more human-like, which goes on for 15 seconds. And in the middle of it, he starts to stand on his two legs and runs at us. We get back in the car so quickly and drive away as fast as we can. And I remember distinctly that sometime in the middle of our panic, our radio starts to come on and it's playing a ward tour by a tribe called Quest. It was one of my favorite songs, but now I can't listen to it without remembering that scene. We came straight home and I pulled my friend to the side and me and my other friend tell him the story of what had happened. And throughout the whole time, he thought we were lying. I think at some point he started to believe the story, but it was by far the creepiest thing I had ever seen. I just can't begin to describe how it was at least nine foot tall and running like a human on two legs. Such a distinctive scream. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Uh, I just want to make it perfectly clear that although the title does say four stories, and in this there are only three, I feel that given how the middle story played out and the separate events that were going on, 
I decided to count it as two, as it was two separate experiences. I really hope that you enjoyed the video. Skinwalkers are some of my favorites. Honestly, I could have done um, three more stories, but they're very long, and this video would have taken about an hour and a half, maybe. And I thought maybe I'd leave it for a future installment, hopefully soon. So there is that. So like I said, June, start of June, nature themed, cryptid themed, that's what we're gonna go for. Um, I might put a poll up tomorrow morning and, uh, and give you guys some options on what you'd like to see for tomorrow. Got some, uh, got some good choices. So I, I'm excited. I hope you guys vote. Well, that being said, I'd like to just give a thanks to everyone who made it this far. And of course, my lovely patrons whose regular donations every month really make a difference. Thanks, guys. Uh, if you are so inclined to also donate, you can find a link in the description on how to do that. Thanks, guys. All right, then. Well, I think for now, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.